Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Israeli Prime Minister Bimi Netanyahu, who is fighting his third election campaign in less than a year, has traveled to Uganda last week in order to meet with Sudan's leader, General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, who expressed his wish to normalize Khartoum's relations with Jerusalem. Sudan, bordering Egypt and Ethiopia, among others, is also important for Israel vis-à-vis -vis Iran's foreign influence. This is only the latest manifestation of Israel's regional reach from the Mediterranean to the Persian Gulf as well as the Red Sea. And joining us to talk about these complexities are Dr. Fadi Ismail, who is a research fellow at the Institute for Counterterrorism at IDC Herzliya. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and Dr. Joshua Krasna, who is a fellow at the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security and a lecturer on Mideast security at both NYU and at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Mr. Oren, give us a broader understanding on uh, the latest developments pertaining to Israel's regional standing. Ever since Israel was established um, in 1948, uh, when its Arab neighbors uh, invaded it, uh, even before um, it was uh, established, it saw its uh, political and defense problems as having uh, three concentric rings. The inner ring is, of course, Palestine. Whatever form it took, the Palestinian Arabs uh, who remained in Israel or those who left it and later became under occupation after 1967. Around that is the uh, uh, neighboring country ring, uh, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt. Uh, these are the countries which again could have invaded Israel and with whom it fought wars. You have to add to that the outer ring or the uh, so-called third circle, which first meant Iraq and now mostly Iran. At one time it was also Libya because it had uh, the uh, fighter planes and other equipment which it could either um, send itself to fight Israel or lend to those confrontation states. But around these three circles, there is also what David Ben-Gurion, the um, founding prime minister of Israel, called the periphery. And that had to do with countries of concern with which Israel uh, could ally itself against the confrontation states. Uh, Turkey, Iran, Uganda, Ethiopia. All of those countries um, either did not want to come under uh, Egyptian influence when Gamal Abdel Nasser was the leader and had uh, pan-Arab and pan-Muslim uh, aspirations, or for other reasons uh, uh, wanted to cooperate with Israel. Now what has happened <coughs> recently is that Israel uh, has uh, both interests and uh, powers which attract uh, countries such as Cyprus, Greece, Italy, in the Eastern Mediterranean, the uh, Arabian Gulf countries, of course they don't call themselves Persian Gulf countries, but those in the Arabian Peninsula, such as Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Oman, and others. And in East Africa, um, what you have are countries such as, again, Uganda, Ethiopia, Eritrea now, but also Sudan, which, of course, neighbors Egypt. At one time, Israel wanted uh, Sudan to harass Egypt. Much as it helped the Kurds in the uh, Iranian-Iraqi border uh, harass Iraqi forces so that they could not be used against Israel, uh, rather that they fight away from the front here. So Sudan was seen by Israel as a place where Egypt uh, could be uh, distracted uh, by. Again, there was also the issue of South Sudan. What is now happening is that following the change of regime in Khartoum, the uh, new regime headed by uh, General Burhan wants to have better relations with Washington, not necessarily Jerusalem or Tel Aviv. Indeed. And Israel can and does deliver Washington to various countries. What happened last week was very interesting. On a Sunday, um, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo called General Burhan and congratulated him on the meeting with Netanyahu, which was still to be held the next day in Uganda. And 
promised to invite him to Washington following that. So there was a quid pro quo. If you normalize, or at least announce that you intend to normalize your relations with Israel, and thereby help Netanyahu in his election campaign, we in Washington will invite you. You remember what happened with Ukrainian President Zelensky, who wanted to be invited to Washington. So Burhan was not invited for a meeting with President Trump yet, only with Pompeo. But this, of course, in his country, will be seen as a measure of his new status. Uh, of course, Mike Pompeo uh, uh, carries plenty of weight being the top diplomat of the uh, uh, so-called Rome of the 21st century. Uh, uh, you left out one country that I think is also very important, the, the strengthening of, of uh, security relations, uh, uh, namely with France, which uh, uh, since the, the Turkish uh, um, uh, deployment of troops in Libya, France decided now also to enter into this pact together with uh, uh, Greece, Italy, and uh, Cyprus, together with uh, Israel, but and it is, is bolstering also but, Israel's standing in the Arab uh, states as well as in Africa. Yes, but it uh, is yet <clears throat> to influence French foreign policy or its policy vis-a-vis -vis the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The influ to influence the policy in Paris is uh, quite a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Ismail, I'd like to uh, hear your perspective. To what degree is Israel now really um, uh, in comparison, of course, with uh, with the 80s, where it was completely isolated for the most part in the region. Now we see more and more uh, successes uh, under the leadership of Prime Minister Netanyahu in the past decade, uh, really being able to break a lot of barriers that uh, were uh, for a very long time hindering Israel's foreign policy and its ability to protect itself from other influences in the region that are a lot more uh, dangerous to it. First of all, I, um, this excellent uh, presentation that combines two areas that I really think we don't talk enough about. It's the area of the Red Sea, as well as, as, well as the East Mediterranean, that a lot of the real politics are happening there. And uh, I don't think there's enough media attention to it here in, in Israel. Uh, of course, the issue of North and East Africa plays a major role. Um, the story with Sudan and the United States, but also Sudan with Ethiopia, and a very, very big, large national security threat to Sudan and Egypt, which is the Renaissance Dam in Ethiopia mm -hmm. or the Nile, that is, uh, it might create a war between Egypt and Ethiopia. And guess what? Guess who's building it? I mean, all, allegedly. Who, who own, yeah, so, okay. If, then you know. So uh, yeah, they say that the owner of the of the building uh, construct construction construct, uh, the construction construct companies are, are Israelis as well. Yeah. So there is a, a very big deal there uh, that also plays into Israel's new relationships with Mali and other countries like that. So yes, the same idea of going to the outer uh, regions to the periphery, uh, same as was done with with with, uh, with Greece and the Cyprus and Italy and the others. Uh, this is how uh, this is a style of Prime Minister Netanyahu. That's what he does. Uh, of course, the big example is a relationship with with Russia. Fifteen years, ten years, fifteen years ago, if we say that this will be the kind of relationship between Israel and Russia, that that would be science fiction. And just think about the thought. I mean, now uh, Russia is a player in Israeli politics, and now that you think about this, it's like obvious. But at the time, it was just non-existent for decades. Russia was no player at all in actually ever in Israeli politics. So we see here a whole new style of policy also, but we don't have, but we can't get caught up in that. In the end, our real problems are right here, like a few kilometers to the east. That's really where it is. But it is really smart to build the whole structure around that will be able, where you are able to isolate the, the security risk. So now you can focus on the economy and diplomacy. That, that, that's what you can do. Dr. Krasma? So, um, I think there's a lot going on here and a lot that's positive for Israel. I think it may be um, a little less than it actually looks like. Um, first of all, you had mentioned the 80s. Well, we're still not where we were in the 90s. Between 94 and 96, we had the best relations that we've had the Arab world under um, uh, the Rabin government because we had different policies. And for that reason, um, and there were different American administrations. And Israel at that point had um, interest sections in almost every one uh, of the non-enemy Arab countries. Um, so we're getting back there, but we're getting back there slowly. And of course, 
while there are tr very significant achievements that we're achieving now, I think they are maybe spun to be more uh, than the NASA. Uh, uh, we were, uh, I, I was looking uh, uh, today, last year when uh, Netanyahu visited Chad, it was reported that a breakthrough with Sudan was imminent. So now the government in, Chad is ch uh, the government in Sudan has changed, uh, and there's still a breakthrough imminent. Um, I think uh, uh, Amir very well uh, uh, sketched out why uh, Sudan would be interested, but Sudan didn't go that final stage. And I think that in the past, if we weren't in an election season like we are now, perhaps a step like Sudan took now would not be um, as widely uh, uh, trumpeted as it is now, because it's being trumpeted for, for I think, um, uh, largely for political reasons. Remember that last year also, during the first election season, um, it was, uh, there was um, uh, reports of an imminent trip by um, uh, Netanyahu to Morocco. And he didn't go to Morocco. And now today I just saw reports that uh, we're trying to put together, uh, Israel is supposedly trying to put together some kind of a package to help um, uh, the Moroccans with the Americans on the Sahara issue in return for which the Moroccans will, um, will uh, uh, renew their diplomatic relations with us. Now, some of this may be true. A lot of it may be spin. Some of it may be stuff that's more long term and that is being trumpeted in the short term because we're working on two different schedules, working on a diplomatic schedule, which is maybe longer, and working on a political schedule, which is, uh, which is very, very tight. I think one, one uh, issue that uh, wasn't mentioned here, which I think is very significant, is um, the role of UAE. Uh, and I think the UAE is, uh, which both is almost the outlier regarding the Trump plan, but also has good relationships uh, 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 with Sudan or um, uh, Sudan, would like uh, to have uh, to maintain good relationship with the UAE. I think the UAE is is uh, is playing a role here as well. Um, mm -hmm. And as I said, I think that uh, that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and his team are doing a very very good job. I think that this is a job that in the past perhaps was done with less uh, um, he um, uh, searchlights than we see right now. Indeed, Mr. Olin, I'd like to ask on uh, the fact that during periods where there is a favorable. Uh, uh, administration in the White House towards Israel, we see a lot of reproachments occurring on the diplomatic as well as on the political level uh, throughout the, the region as well as Africa, Asia, and, and elsewhere. Uh, but when there is uh, less supportive uh, administrations, uh, we can really see that uh, more and more of those same countries that uh, seemingly want to uh, improve relations with Israel are starting to turn a cold shoulder. To what degree is Israel impacted by American foreign policy and its ability to really uh, influence uh, certain administrations uh, that uh, in policies that are still in line with American interests for that matter? It's the intersection of uh, two different um, streams. One is great power rivalry, and the other is uh, decolonization. Israel came out of the uh, um, aftermath of the Second World War as part of the decolonization wave. It wasn't seen that way at the time. But if you look at it, India got it independ its independence in the summer of 1947, and the partition plan for Israel and Palestine followed uh, shortly. And when Israel uh, became uh, a state um, with viable uh, forces and abilities, it started helping the newly emerging countries of the decolonization uh, era in Asia and Africa, um, it didn't expect anything in return at first. It sent experts in, in agriculture, in development, in education, and built a reservoir of goodwill. This was in the late 50s and 1960s when Golda Meir was foreign minister, uh, when uh, Israel's Mossad started helping the security services, the military, the Israeli Defense Forces helped build the military, and... Um, the, um, the goodwill which was achieved was not enough when Arab pressure following the 1967 war, Arab pressure built along with the oil embargo or, or oil, oil uh, prices going up. So those African countries 
uh, helped by Israel, uh, turned out uh, to be less than grateful and started breaking relations. When Rabin came in, as uh, Joshua mentioned, with the Oslo process, it blossomed again. Um, I happened to be with Netanyahu three years ago on another trip of his to uh, Uganda, Rwanda, uh, Kenya, and uh, Ethiopia. At one point, he addressed a group of Israelis and uh, listed uh, his achievements. He said that when he was the Israeli permanent representative, the ambassador to the United Nations, 30 years earlier, in the mid-80s, there were only some 80 countries which recognized Israel. And now, uh, a few years ago, uh, there was double that number. And someone in the audience mentioned, yes, but Oslo happened in the meantime. The, the big jump from non-recognition of Israel to good relations was when, when Oslo took place, when the Palestinians had... It was a spark, it, when which Oslo, led to se several yes, achievements. But, no, what happened was, even the interim agreement with the Palestinians gave the Jordanians cover to have a peace with Egypt, and the is, rapprochement with between with, with Israel and and uh, the rapprochement between Israel and various Arab forces, again as Joshua mentioned, gave Israel an entree to the uh, Gulf and to other places, North Africa, and Rabin and and uh, Paris who followed him could could go to to Morocco and to uh, Indonesia and other countries uh, who up until that time feared Arab retribution if they have um, overt relations with Israel. Dr. Ismail, uh, your perception on the current situation, to what degree is the American administration impacting uh, Jerusalem's international standing? Uh, and uh, the fact also that uh, we hear more and more um, uh, member states within the European Union that want to strengthen uh, the bilateral relations with Israel as opposed to the European Union's institutions that are very, very solid on their policy and on their regulations and so on, saying one thing and actually doing another. Well, <clears throat> the, that's a currency. Israel's influence in Washington, D.C., as much as uh, many people don't like to talk about this, but hey, we either talk about the true stuff or not. Yeah, but it's a two-way street. Yeah, of course, nothing is, uh, is given for free, but many countries would have would love to have this two-way street with Washington, D.C., and they can't. So for a variety of reasons, over the decades that passed since 1967, even a little slightly before that, there is a, a, um, a real, real, true connection between the deep states in both hands. It is not about uh, necessarily Trump and Netanyahu. Even when they go away, we will still have that very, very close connection between the two countries. The world sees that. And countries, states, operate based upon interest. They have interest. Now, when you mention the European Union, the European Union was perceived as, in a way, among other functions of it, one of them also as a competitor to the United States. It was supposed to be the United States of Europe, in a sense. Uh, they can't, I mean, you have a new president now that is not really, they're not, they're not winning that. And you have Brexit. You have Brexit, you have... Uh, all the, the new tariffs and all these things, and now they realize the specific countries that that approach, that united uh, Europe approach is not really united, it's not giving them what they need. And so now they need all kinds of abilities to influence things in Washington, sometimes to the level of middle management. And you want to have people on your side who know how to talk to that middle management. I used to be in DC, I used to see, I, I was a little bit part of that middle management, and I, you have to know how to approach people. And many times the Europeans would be very, their approach would be very, uh, a turn off. I mean, to be honest, I mean, the way there was something very, um, I wouldn't say cocky or arrogant, but there, there was this, always this uh, feeling from them that they, they don't really, that they see themselves as competitors more than actual allies. So on the other hand, working with other countries like Israel, Egypt, um, you'd be surprised some elements of the Chinese regime and so on. You would feel that they were more, cl they knew how to work us, you know what I mean? So now you need that entree, and Israel has a fantastic uh, advantage in DC, uh, whether it is European Union or other countries. Um, remember, when Turkey first came, came close to Israel in the in late 90s, they wanted access to the US and access to Israel's military technology. Now they have a president who thinks that he has, he has nothing else to gain from that. 
I think he's making a big mistake. And that's why we saw the shift. Um, it's a very big and very, very big issue and a very sensitive issue. It's very hard to talk about this without uh, stepping all kinds of, in the minefield, um, which is obvious to everyone. But it is true that people who are friendly to Israel also tend to be very influential in DC. And the world is not stupid, the world sees that. Dr. Krasna, uh, Israel, uh, as uh, we hear, of course, is is very uh, close to uh, the United States, but it also has very warm relations currently with uh, Russia and strong relations with China. Uh, of course, uh, the it, it's you can compare it to the American relations okay. with Israel, but at the same time, uh, the dynamic allows Israel to maneuver in different fields. Uh, and uh, when we're talking about the European Union, for instance, which is a set of states, uh, states rather than one uh, central government, the, the parliament in Brussels does not really impact uh, the European member states to the degree that it would like to and aspires to, but at the same time, Israel understands this and it rather have uh, uh, understandings together with Amsterdam, uh, uh, Brussels, the Belgian government, and uh, uh, Paris, rather with uh, uh, Brussels and Strasbourg, for that matter. Mm -hmm. To what degree do you see these relations impacting Israel's thinking and, and activities pertaining to its foreign policy? So um, I'll start with China, and I'll put it right on the side. I think Israel um, may have gone too far with China, and now understanding um, or it didn't go too far, it went as far as it thought it should, but the uh, Americans moved the goalposts, and I think Israel now is in a complicated position because it's, the relationship with China is extremely important to Israel. It's part of, uh, not only is it important economically, but it's part of Netanyahu's worldview of being a global power that has relations with all of the major powers. But right now, that I think is sort of the, the, uh, um, the mind that he has to be careful to step on. Uh, regarding Russia, um, Israel has to have good relationship with Russia because Russia is now a neighboring state with Israel. But Israel also wants uh, 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 the ties with Russia. Um, the reporting, uh, uh, including uh, people I've spoken to who, who know, say um, the two president, uh, the prime minister and the president have a good personal relationship. They both see each other as somebody they can do business with. Um, uh, the Russian, uh, the turn towards Russia, perhaps under Obama, a little bit under Trump less, is not really... Um, something that you can use to manipulate the Americans because th while the Americans don't like Russia, the president of the United States does. So um, there, Israel pays little cost on having this good relationship with Russia in terms of the Americans. And therefore, to have good relationship with, the, with two of them, basically the two major powers in the region and Russia, which is the major power, which is actually today, I think, more influential in the region, is always a, a good deal. Now, regarding the Europeans, the Amer uh, Israel has seen the, it sees three different Europes. It sees the European Union and its organs, not interested in them. It sees the major European states, France, Italy, Britain, Germany, which Israel always wants to have good relations with and has sort of a love-hate relationship with, but will always engage with those countries because those are the countries um, from which we um, uh, absorb legitimacy and, um, and also who we have a, a lot of other connections with. And of course, the last is the new members of the European Union in Eastern Europe, which Israel feels, an, uh, or this government in Israel, I should say, feels an ideological kinship with. Those countries also don't like the European Union organs, also don't like Arabs. So from the point of view of the, uh, of the current Israeli government, it's really a win-win situation. It both weakens the European Union by having a contact with these countries, and it lets them build kind of a, a uh, constellation of like-minded um, uh, right, center-right or right-wing governments that Israel feels very comfortable working with. Right? Not to forget also that even though the European Union was the biggest trade partner of the state of Israel, uh, the biggest significant portion of that was Great Britain. So now yeah. with Brexit, uh, the leverage sure. of the European Union over Israel has diminished even further. Mm -hmm. uh, we're drawing near to the end of the program, so I'd like to give each and every one of you the opportunity to have a closing assessment of Israel's regional standing and where we're heading to. Mr. Ogan, we'll start with you. There are three possible phases. One is a peace process, the like of which maybe the uh, Trump vision for peace and prosperity uh, will uh, generate. Probably not, but this is a possibility. The other one is war. And in both of these extreme cases, uh, a peace process and a regional war, Israel's alliances will be tested. It also has to do with the length of the war. As for the third phase, the status quo, so far so good. Dr. Ismail? 
Well, as far as the connections between Israel and, and D.C., I don't see any anything but uh, status quo. There's a very, very strong possibility that Trump will be re-elected, uh, unlike what some of the media says. Uh, nobody knows, of course. Uh, we're still 10 months ahead. Uh, uh, and um, But I, as in, in terms of the U.S.-Israeli relationship, I think it's a solid ground. Dr. Cross. I think on the region, I think that uh, the Trump plan may be a poisoned apple for Israel. I think the Palestinian issue had been pushed way down on everybody's radar, and that enabled Israel to develop good relationship with uh, the moderate Arab states. And I think that now that it's pushed its way back to the center, it caused a problem because some of these countries have excellent relations with Israel under the surface, regarding the, especially uh, regarding the Iranian issue. But once the Palestinian issue, and especially the issue of annexation of territories, has been put on the table, these countries now are going to have to... Um, toe a line both internally and uh, in the Arab world. We saw it in the Arab League this way. We saw it in the Organization of Islamic States. Um, the uh, Sudanese may have not gotten the memo, so they're a little bit uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, confused right now. But I think that, that theoretically um, it's something that may help uh, um, uh, the uh, incumbent politically, but that in terms of Israel's interests, it was probably not the right time for the Palestinian issue to put this, to put uh, this blatantly onto the uh, front burner. We didn't talk about Iran, Mr. Olin, right. very uh, shortly. Next year, after the uh, next administration, or this one is re-elected, enters office, and after the Israeli government is uh, finally stabilized, they will confront Iran, either for a new agreement or uh, perhaps for an escalation. A topic that we will revisit, of course, as it is uh, significant for the state of Israel. Uh, this is all the time that we have for today, so I'd like to thank Dr. Ismail, Mr. Oren, and Dr. Krasner for being with us today. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we will see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem.